And our next session, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, I'm very, very happy to welcome Nora Rackley. Um, she has worked at Lake Sumner State College for 21 years, starting as a library technician and moving on to a position as a reference instruction librarian. Born and raised in Miami, Florida, she received her bachelor's degree in English from Florida International University and her master's from um, University of South Florida. Her focus and specialty as a librarian is content creation through LibGuides, citation instruction, and information literacy instruction. And with that, Nora, thank you so much for presenting your project today. Thank you, Kendra, for having me. So, okay, so let's get started. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about a textbook affordability project that we undertook here at Lake Sumter with um, literature textbooks. And um, if you were around earlier today for Claire's presentation, you're going to see a lot of parallels, which I was very happy about. So let's go on. And um, I'm just going to give you an overview of our problem, what the project entailed, um, our results, and some outlook for the future. Okay, so we know that um, rising textbook costs are a concern at colleges and universities nationwide. Um, in 2015, one of our faculty members teaching ENC 1102 approached me with the idea of creating a library guide that included the works of literature she'd be covering in her class. Um, she had several students that semester that just couldn't afford the textbook and she wanted to give them an alternative um, and the option of not buying it. So she wanted to just kind of replace the textbook. So that's the where the idea for this project was born. The instructor really wanted um, just the primary sources, but I started to think that if we're going to replace the textbook, we also needed some of the added content that the textbooks provide, some like some of the biographical articles or supplementary analysis of the literature. So I went ahead and added those as well. So that one professor told her department chair, who loved the idea and told everybody else, and by the end of that semester, which was the fall of 2015, we had seven instructors who wanted to try and replace their textbooks with a library guide. Um, and so this grew into this massive project that I had to figure out how to manage. And um, I created this literary works master guide that includes all the primary and secondary sources that we're um, putting together. And everything's compiled in one place. Um, I'm going to give you the URL for this here in the chat box. OK. Um, so it's a repository for all the works, and it also includes hidden pages for librarians that helps us manage it in the background. We have the templates and we have um, work in progress pages that allow us to all kind of collaborate together here. All right, so, um, all right, so. I know this is small, but if you're following along online through that um, link that I provided, this is the short fiction authors A through G page. I just want to kind of show you what one of these pages entailed. The short fiction and the poetry sections were so large that I had to divide, had to divide them into three. Um, and it basically, this serves as a master guide. So when an instructor asks for a new guide, I go to this master list, give, it, give them the URL, and have them pick the works that they want. Anything they don't see on here, I can add um, as a new box. And then the new work becomes part of the repository for others to use. Um, it, it gives the instructors flexibility because they can pick whatever that's on here and whatever else they would want to add. And it's also a huge time saver for us because all we do is we reuse these boxes on individual instructors' guides. Um, the master standardizes the content so that all the students see the same thing. So if they're all studying the cask of Amontillado, for example, they're all seeing the story in the same format. They're all seeing the same primary and secondary sources. 
And also, regardless of whatever librarian builds a new guide, they're, ha they're going into the same place, into the same repository. So they're all um, getting, get grabbing from the same resources. So um, I used primarily for the primary resources, I used Project Gutenberg and Bartleby. Our guides have only links to the primary sources. We don't provide any content that we house within the LibGuide. So no PDF files, we don't upload documents, nothing like that. We're just linking. Um, for poetry, I've used primary primarily whenever possible the Poetry Foundations website because it's so easy to access and easy to use and so clean. And then again, if I couldn't find something in one of those sources, I would go to the databases. Some um, literary magazines publish literature that um, are available through the databases. Um, for many of the works that are still under copyright, I was able to find links to them. Um, on the web. For the things that I couldn't find, um, many professors were willing to substitute works or find other things that they could use. And in some cases, we've been using e-resources or print reserves. For secondary sources, um, I used primarily database resources like Gale Virtual Reference Library, Gale Literary Sources, and Literary Reference Center. I like I link to the articles using stable URLs from our databases. Um, our literary instructors mostly want the students to use academic resources. So like Claire was saying, I, I wanted to model what a good resource was and I don't include anything on here that an instructor would frown upon. So let's look at an individual instructor's LibGuide here. Um, let me copy and paste this link for you. Okay, um, this is the link to, um, or the image of um, one of our professors, uh, Professor Carlin's LibGuide for ENC 1102. Um, it, most of the LibGuides for ENC 1102 have a standard setup, which is right here. You have tabs for short fiction, poetry, and drama for the most part, and then um, literary research and MLA basics. Grammarly is something that Professor Carlin's wanted specifically, so a few things change, but not necessarily a lot. So um, we can adapt to the individual instructor. We have some instructors that want fables, novels, or nonfiction, so we can add tabs for that. Um, I'm going to show you next um, a copy of Professor Carlin's Lit 2000 guide as an example of something that's organized in a completely different way. For this class, she wanted to, to organize the course by period rather than genre. So um, we've done that here. Um, I have another professor that organizes it by unit. I've had instructors who like to organize the literature by theme. So this method is flexible to whatever the instructor needs. All right. Um, since most of the guides are organized by genre, I'm going to go back to the ENC 1102 guide um, for Professor Carlin's, and I'm just going to go over each page. Um, the first page is our Getting Started, which basically includes the same boxes um, on all of the guides, um, a list of EBSCO databases, a search box, a catalog search box, a list of some of the other databases. Um, we have under the navigation bar a graphic of some sort and some librarian information. So all of these are basically the the starting point for the classes. Um, the short fiction, poetry, and drama tabs are the ones that actually include the literature. Um, so I'm just going to select the drama um, tab to show you because it's short and <laughs> it fits on one screen. So here you go. Um, the tab usually includes a box for each work of literature along with an instruction box at the top. Um, the order of the works on the page depends on the order that the instructors prefer, and most of the time it's just the order in which they cover it on their syllabus. Um, so 
I'm going to show you a single box now, and I'm going to pick one at random that has several features I want to illustrate. Um, all of the boxes that I will be showing from this slide on are available on the Master Literary Works Guide, which is the first link that I shared with you. So here is the box for Edgar Allan Poe's The Cask of Amontillado. All the boxes consist of three or four tabs. Um, the first is for the primary source, the story, the poem, whatever it is. Um, our second tab is for a video, which is not available in all of the boxes. I try to stick with videos from Films on Demand or a new database that we just acquired called Alexander Street Video because both provide a transcript and subtitles for ADA compliance. I try to not include a video that is not at least subtitled um, so that students have access to no matter what um, their restrictions might be. Um, the other two tabs, author biography and critical analysis, contain uh, links to articles. Um, usually the author biography tab, if you can see right there, it includes a literary biography from one of the big sources like Dictionary of Literary Biography or um, American writers or British writers that are available through Gale Virtual Reference um, Library Database. The critical analysis tab includes um, the basic research and like Claire said in her presentation I try to keep students to the resources that are academic yet still accessible to them um, for example I use a lot of short stories for students I use literature and its times whenever it's available and then I try to find the um, standalone journal articles from journals that aren't going to be over their head. So I do find some things from the JSTOR database, but often those are so advanced that students have trouble accessing them. Um, one of the major complaints we hear from literature professors is that students don't understand what literary analysis is. These sources offer not only those that credible literary analysis, but also an example of how one actually conducts literary analysis. The only rule is that we include something that an instructor would find credible. Um, and as Claire found, and she's confirming this stuff for me, is that we've saw as a side effect that their critical analysis, their own papers, were getting better because of this. Um, so I'm giving, giving you here a different box. Um, this one's for Flannery O'Connor's A Good Man is Hard to Find. Um, when available, I try to add other modalities to the library guides. So if there's an audio version available for free, I use that. Um, I have added um, Kindle versions that were available on um, other texts. Um, so I like to embed videos whenever possible, and I break my own rule here um, with subtitles and YouTube and things like that. And it's because, you know, Dylan Thomas re reciting his own um, poem of Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night, it's pretty, it's pretty neat to listen to. And if it's a poem, they've already got it in front of them, so I kind of fudge it. Um, transcripts become much more important to me when we're using a supplementary video or where, when it's a dramatization of the work. Um, as you can see underneath this video, um, I've got a link to a Films on Demand video and instructions on how to access it. Um, I, I just like the fact that embedding videos adds a um, visual interest to the pages. Okay, so here is another one of the pages on Professor Carlin's guide. This is a literary research and criticism um, page, and it includes some instructional materials for the students. Um, so, um, so let's look at each of the boxes individually here.
All right. Um, so I've got um, Introduction to Literary Criticism. This is a box that is basically um, selected by one of our literature instructors, and it's basically a list of links explaining the different schools of criticism and literary theory. These all come from Purdue OWL. I have a box of definitions, which I really would like to expand. I'm wanting to recruit maybe some English faculty to, who would be willing to put some literary terms in here. And then finally, um, on the page, we have an explanation of the difference between primary and secondary sources. Okay, so that's our library guides. Let's look at a result of the um, project. What we've what we've done with this. All right, we're going to look a little bit at what the impact has been, the overall faction for the project, and potential expansion. So here's our pilot project by the numbers. Um, we had seven faculty members who participated in the pilot. This included 14 sections of ENC 1102 and Lit 2000 that have been delivered in fully seated, fully online, or hybrid modes. In the first semester, we reached we reached 238 students, and we had 10,533 total page views, averaging out to approximately 44 page views per student. On average, each participating student saved about $153 on a textbook. Instructors love this. They just loved it, loved every aspect of it. Um, they loved the flexibility, the accessibility. They can embed them into Blackboard, which is the LMS that we're using currently. They can switch out literature whenever they want. So they felt that students read the course materials for the semester, and they liked that the library guides provided added analytical content as well. Um, one of the comments from one of the professors was that he, that he received the highest levels of literature analysis that he's seen yet um, and loved the fact that we are providing this resource um, adding the critical analysis was kind of a side effect it was we weren't we didn't have a particular purpose of teaching them what literary analysis was but that's what happened and so what Claire is seeing and what I'm seeing is perfect I mean uh, across the board the same here um, we did ask students. We only had a 3.3 response rate from them, so I'm not seeing that as very valid, but I'm hoping that their um, responses increase a little bit. Um, they, for the most part, the ones that responded, like the flexibility and convenience of the guides. So after our pilot, we've this project's been going on for one full year now, um, all the way through, and we've expanded from that original seven faculty members to 14 who have dropped the literature textbook altogether. Um, we, the project's grown from 18 boxes <laughs> to 220 boxes, and we've started with 1102 and Lit 2000, but now we've got theater appreciation courses that are taking this up. We've got a creative writing instructor wants to use the guide in the fall and it's also um, expanded that idea we've got instructors who want to use this for ENC 1101 in, and ENC 2300 that they want to completely dump the textbook and use resources that are available for free the program is very adaptable. Um, anyone can create a guide like this and make it as flexible as they want. So what you're seeing here is a um, guide for an earth science course. And as a result of this project, um, we've been invited to speak to faculty numerous times about our services and textbook affordability. And we've had several instructors add supplementary LibGuides to their courses. Um, let me give you the link to this guide. One second here. Okay, so this is an earth science course, and the instructor wanted basically a repository to house supplementary materials to coincide with each chapter of her book. So we've added a tutorial to help students complete the research assignment for the class, and then we also have a link to APA style documentation there. Um, let me just give you a closer look on what each of the chapters includes. We're going to go to chapter 14 here. 
and basically um, it has additional readings, um, podcasts, an infographic, and a video. I just kind of edited the page to show just one of the videos, but there's actually like three videos on this. And we are embedding videos from Films on Demand in this LibGuide. So in the near future, we are hoping to recruit more English instructors who can um, provide more of that supplementary material, the definitions, and maybe um, some text that goes over how to write in the literary disciplines. Um, we're also looking to add guys by reaching out to literature adjuncts and recruit them into using this resource. Um, we're going to be collaborating with the biology department to assist them in adding supplementary materials to the course. Um, and they want to transition to an open source textbook because they're just tired of the publishers changing their minds every two years. Um, and then finally, um, they, we want to evaluate the guides and conduct some additional student and faculty service to help improve our projects. So here are some links. I'm sure that these are going to be posted on the virtual conference LibGuide. And with that, I can open up to questions. And here's my contact information if you have any more questions after today. Thank you so much, Nora. This is great. So while we're waiting on people to type in their questions, I'll go ahead and ask mine. Um, OK. <laughs> so at what, what point have you gotten support from any department chairs or deans? I mean, for your humanities department, this is pretty incredible, impressive. Um, Yes, I have. Everybody loves this. Um, we have our administration who is super enthusiastic about the project and have shared it. Um, but they're still leaving each other an instructor to decide. I mean, it's not. Like um, yeah, they ha they are. <laughs> um, we we've had a, incredible support here, but they are leaving it to instructors to decide. And um, yeah, so I guess from that perspective, they're not you know, they they don't want to step on anybody's toes in that way and say, you must do this. But um, we have gotten support and I pretty much have converted most of the English department. I'm still working on a few of them. So <laughs> bravo. <laughs> <laughs> Tough cookies. Uh, yes, they can. <laughs> so do any of your instructors like um, insist on doing like their own thing? Have anybody, any of them like embedded your like LibGuides boxes into their LMS, for instance, or, or anything like that? Or are they content with sending people to your LibGuide yeah. link? They're embedding. Many of them are oh, embedding yeah. the LibGuide. They're, most of them want to embed the entire LibGuide because they want the students to have access to everything. Okay. I have one or two that are embedding individual pages in individual sections. Okay. So when they're covering the short stories, they embed the short stories page. When they are covering poetry, they embed the poetry page, etc. Oh, good, good. Yeah. Are you still able? Are you able to still collect the the statistics from those guides even when they're embedded? Are you good? I believe so. Yeah. I, I believe so. I believe it counts as an access point. Okay. Um, I I really don't know that the answer oh, to that, okay. but yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> the my last question, since no one else is uh, is putting them in, is um you know it looks like you've really given me some something to think about where um, how we as librarians teach literary analysis. Um, you know, the, my, my personal focus has been on, you know, how to find and perhaps, you know, from what I'm hearing, um, you know, I should really consider spending more time on, on showing excellent examples and, um, you know, focusing more on what is rather than how to find. And that's um, it's it's very interesting because we've found that I guess we've all had this pre preconceived notion that we just need to help 
students locate this information. But students are really at a loss as to what they're actually looking for, as I'm sure that Claire has found. We found this across the board for um, nursing. Our nursing instructors have us locate articles for students because they, they want students to find some research. So um, the students have um, found that if we give them that first article that they need for their reviews that they need to do for their class, they're more successful at finding the next five that they need to do. So it's, it's across the board, it's almost like we have to be intrusive. We have to throw it in their face so they know what it is they need. And let's see, Faith asks, does our college have a college career success course or component? And if so, any work with faculty? Um, we haven't had any, or, or a lot, I should say, of direct work. We are in there trying to teach information literacy um, with them and many of the SLS 1501 um, instructors bring their students into the library. Um, but I, we find still that when they're looking for that specific research, they don't know exactly what it is they need. And so they go out to schmoop.com and provide literary research. Um, we see this even with giving them these sources that they're not all of the students are using them. I had to correct a paper earlier this week <laughs> that had, um, I had to tell the student that five of her six resources were not valid. Yeah, no, I know, not schmoop, but yeah, schmoop. <laughs> That's what they use. Uh, You're welcome, Faith. All right. Are there any last questions for Nora? All righty. Nora, thank you again. We really You're appreciate welcome. it. You're welcome. Um, this presentation is um, posted on the um, conference lib guide, and um, we'll put the recording for this session up sometime in the near future. So uh, thank you again. We really appreciate you presenting today. Okay, no problem.